Over 5 million people in the UK live in a leasehold, a property ownership agreement which entitles people to the space inside the property, but not necessarily the building it's in, nor the land it's built upon. England and Wales are the last countries in the world where leaseholds are still widely used. So why is this? How does it affect the 5 million people living in these properties? And is it all a big feudal con? To discuss all of this and more, I'm joined by Rachel Cunliffe, Associate Political Editor at The New Statesman. And also with us in the studio is Barry Gardner, Labour MP for Brent North, who's been a long-time campaigner for the abolition of leaseholds. Thanks too long. So much. Yeah, too too long. long. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming in, Barry. Um, Rachel and I have often discussed our own predicaments as leaseholders with each other, um, but we wondered why you came to this uh, as a campaigning issue. It was in, oh, probably within six months or a year after I was first elected in 1997. Mm. And... Uh, um, some residents came to me. They they lived in a, a, a block of flats in Mount Air Court in, in my constituency. And there were 30 of them in the block. And they said, look, we've got a problem. We've actually had our landlord come to us and say that he wants £23,500 each. Now, remember, this is 26 years yeah, ago, yeah. right? Oh. Um, £23,500 each to do the roof repairs, to do the window repairs, all the repairs we've been begging them to do for years and that they've not done. But when we passed over the money, the landlord then went into liquidation. Uh, that was the head leaseholder. And I said, well, look, that can't be right. There, there must be some law that says these monies have to be held in trust. And, you know, I'm sure that you're secured in the law. So I went away and I did some research and I came back to them. And I said, look, I'm, I'm really sorry, you're not. Mm. So I then held a, an adjournment debate with if Nick Rainsford, if you remember Nick, who was then the housing minister, um, and just put forward what had happened. And suddenly my office became an incident room for leaseholders all around the country writing to me. And in fact, it was, you know, Wittgenstein's Tractatus and the, the Blue and Brown books, you know, it was circulating on the black market. Right. This, <laughs> this leasehold reform <laughs> debate, you know, was, was going around leasehold communities. You know, somebody's taking up leasehold. Um, so that was what was the inspiration behind the 2002 Act, mm -hmm. which was the uh, Leasehold and Common, Common Hold and Leasehold Reform Act. Uh, and of course, that just went nowhere near far enough to solving the problem. Mm -hmm. And actually, I said that in the third reading speech I, I made in the House in 2002. It was, you know, it was never going to be enough. Now, I said then, we will have to come back to this in six or seven years time. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Yeah. 20 years, 22 years later, and we're still not fixing it. This bill doesn't, the one that's going through Parliament at the moment, just doesn't fix it. Right. And, and can you just provide a brief overview of what leasehold property ownership actually entails? You did, that, Anisha, you did that really well in okay. the opening. <laughs> it, basically, it, it allows you the right to live in the property for a period of time. But I mean, the extraordinary thing about this is it's like a yo-yo, isn't it? You know, um, you pay the full price for the property. There's no difference between a leasehold flat and, and a, a flat that's, you know, sold with a, a share of freehold when you buy it. But actually, after 99 years or 125 years, that property ceases to be yours or your, your children's. It goes back to the very people who sold it to you in the first place or their children. Usually it's a trust. Usually it's somebody like the Duke of Westminster or the Duke of Buccleuch or the Duke of this or the Duchess of that, you know, or some sort of trust. And this is really strange that, that you can pay full price for something and then it, it ceases to be yours. But more than that, landlords have now found a way of, of extracting rent out mm. of it during the process. And I think this is possibly the most worrying thing over the past 20 years or so, that they've found new ways. In, in the old days, it was, well, if, if the roof needs repaired we as the landlord will tell you when it's going to be done, who's going to be doing it. Often it would be an arm's length company with the same beneficial owner um, and how much you'll pay for it. So they had all the decision making power, but actually you had to pay up whatever they said. And that was the whole service charge scam. And there were ground rent scams and all sorts of scams. But these have been turbocharged over the past 20 years or so. In they've 
they've actually developed a new model of leasehold houses, not leasehold flats mm. anymore, but houses um, where they're built on an estate and you're paying a ground rent for no service at all and then you're paying a service charge because the roads haven't been adopted by the local authority uh, or there is supposed to be some sort of landscaping. Mm -hmm. um, we've had situations where the supposed manager was charging for the management of land they didn't even own. Oh, wow. You know, uh, it, it's been it's just been appalling the way in which they've constantly seen new ways to extract rent out of out of the whole process of of property ownership. Yes. And of course, the building safety crisis, this is the scandal of leaseholders having to shoulder the costs of post Grenfell um, fire safety defects has has put this more onto the political agenda, hasn't it, in recent years? Because there's so many stories, stories that, like the examples that you gave of just ridiculous ask for leaseholders who had, you know, done everything right and bought their flat in good faith. Um, and then sometimes people that I've interviewed have had their um, properties rendered sort of worth zero. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I I've spoken and written about my own predicaments as a leaseholder, but they're nowhere near the, the difficulties that some people have faced. I mean, I've spoken to people who have been plunged into mental health crises, um, ended up bankrupt. Huge amount of debt. Yeah, in huge amount of debt. Um, and also people who, you know, uh, want to ha have new family homes, you know, a bigger place to move to who can't. So their actually plans for starting a family have been curtailed by this issue, um, as well as pensioners seeing their pensions crumble away on service charges and insurance going up in that way that you, you so well explained, um, Barry, of, of the property owners extracting more and more money out of those leaseholds. Um, but the example that I always give is the is the mo the black mould on my bathroom ceiling. So I live in an old ex sort of local authority block, I'm a leaseholder. Um, and I will complain to my housing association, say, you know, there's mould on my ceiling. They say, well, you're a leaseholder, so you fix it. So I say, OK, I'll fix it. And they say, no, no, but don't touch it because there's asbestos in your ceiling. So I say, OK, so, you know, that's your asbestos. Can you can you fix that, please? Oh, no, 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 you're the leaseholder. OK, I'll fix the asbestos. No, no, you can't touch it. So it's the Schrodinger's mould. That's how I, that's how yes. I explain <laughs> it. And I've had various problems um, like that, like fitting an extractor fan, fixing a communal waste pipe, which is quite a biblical example of the problem. Problem where you can't do it yourself, but they won't do it for you because you're the leaseholder. And the way I explain it is they are the landlord when it suits them, when they, you know, are set to make money out of the building. So they're currently building flats on top of my flat. They're going to make money out of that. Um, so they own the building. You're not going to get any of that no, value. No. But You'll get they, all the structural consequences Exactly, of and it. all yeah. the consequences. So anything which will require a cost, they suddenly have nothing to do with it at all and you are the homeowner. So that's, that's how I describe it. And of course, I would say to many of our listeners who won't be leaseholders, we have done um, a whole episode on, you know, the, the rental crisis and the crisis in, in, in poor, poor quality social housing as well. So we have spoken about all the different ways that housing can 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 be in a mess in this country but leaseholders is is one really important issue and Rachel I wonder if you want to give us some of your experiences. I also feel very fortunate having listened to uh, various stories of, of increased costs um, because my situation was better than that uh, but it was still very very clear that I didn't own the property in the way that I thought I owned the property and the way this became apparent was with service charges mm. it was about a thousand pounds a year which is quite reasonable and then suddenly one year it was three thousand for the six month period and I wow. went okay well what's that about and they went yeah we've done all our accounts and that that's what it is and I went why can I speak to somebody and this was met with a huge amount of confusion as to why I'd want to do that. But I sat down with the guy from the management company and he just started as, at, at this particular company and he looked through it all and he was like, well, that doesn't look right. That's the kind of services charges we'd expect from a building that had a lift or like a gym in the basement. A concierge. A concierge like yeah. none of those things. It's a fairly, a fairly standard 1990s block and he goes I'm sure that's wrong I'll, I'll get back to you, you know, months pass I get a legal letter from them saying you haven't paid and I sort of go back and say but we're in this kind of process I just, I just want to know what it's for and then he comes back to me and goes oh no actually it is it is right <laughs> I said you haven't explained any of this to me <laughs> anyway this went on for two and a half years and the only reason uh, it ended is because I wanted to sell the flat at which point you can't sell a leasehold property if there's any kind of dispute yes. ongoing with it so 
I paid it and I then paid a huge amount I felt something like 600 pounds for to the to the to the the freeholder for the right to have the conversation with the buyer solicitors so that they would even give up the information mm. that would enable them to do that and then there was a row over the lease and I don't want to add up how much money I spent <laughs> on it because I'm out of it and the one thing that me and my husband have said is we will never buy a leasehold property again because even without the fire safety and the issues like black mold, you are liable for all of these costs, but you are not in control. You don't get to speak to contractors. You don't get to look at, well, is this work necessary? Is it not? What's the most cost effective way of doing it? You just have to pay. And if you don't, they can take you to court. And that just seemed a very strange, in a country that is sort of predicated and prides itself on, on contract law and, and things <laughs> like there were two sides of this. It just seemed a very strange arrangement. And it's an arrangement that I didn't really understand no, until I was that. in it. And I think a lot of people are like that they feel like they own their home once they have sort of signed that paperwork and got the keys and then they discover very quickly that actually they, they don't own it in the way that they thought they did. Can I pick up yeah. on, on what you're saying? Because that that is so much the case and the way in which many of the developers now, some of some of the major names in, in housing construction, this company have down done this, is that they're building these uh, leasehold homes and they then, you know, they make offers like, you know, we'll, we'll have carpets fitted for you and, and you can use our lawyer. And there's the rub because you, you get their lawyer free, basically. Um, their lawyer is not acting for you. Yeah. And many people have told us this was evidence given to the, the bill committee, actually, um, that they didn't know they were buying a leasehold house until it came to the point of signing the contract. So nobody had explained to them that this was not a freehold purchase. Now, if if you're going into a flat, you know it's going to be yeah. a leasehold purchase yeah. or it's going to be at very best a common hold or, or with a, a leasehold with a share of freehold. But when you're buying a house, you just think, well, I'm buying a house like any other house. But they weren't. And and this whole relying on people's ignorance mm. is the way in which they entrap people and make the money out of service charges on the estate and ground rent. And some of the ground rents, what they've done is they've actually put a, a very small print clause in in the lease that says the ground rent rent will double um, every five or ten years. Now, you probably know the story about the guy who invented chess <laughs> and the king of Persia who said, you know, I'll give you whatever you want. He said, hey, just give me a grain of rice on the first square. By the time you get to the 64th square, there isn't enough rice in the whole world to fill it. Um, doubling, 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 doubling. And if that's over the period of 150 years, 125 year lease, um, you end up paying thousands of pounds. And there's there's one case at the moment that I've heard of where a woman's been paying £36,000 service charge, service charge, um, you know, where people have been faced with £20,000 ground rent. It's extracting money and it's extracting money with menaces because exactly the point that you said, Rachel, about the way in which lawyers then get involved and you get this stroppy lawyer's letter saying you haven't paid your service charge or you haven't paid your ground rent. Actually, they then come if, if you don't, unlike you who eventually paid up. If you don't, what then happens is they say, well, forfeiture. You were talking about what uh, uh, three thousand pounds, right? Well, that should go to the small claims court, right? Up to ten thousand pounds, you 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 go to the small claims court, you 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 get uh, you get a judgment in 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 the courts. But no forfeiture means that they can come and they can take the whole property. They can then sell the property from under you. You might be talking. I don't know what your. Don't tell me what your property was worth. Um, uh, but you know, it might be three, four, five hundred thousand pounds if it's a, an apartment in London. Um, they can take that because you haven't paid three thousand yeah. pounds. 
and they don't have to give you the £497,000 back that they've made on the transaction. And this was one of the things that we thought in this bill going through Parliament, we thought, well, here at last is a chance to deal. It's, it's a poor bill. It's tinkering around the edges. But at least we'll get something on forfeiture. Nothing. Oh, wow. You know? Yeah. Now, let's hope the Lords put it in. And when it comes back from the Lords, it's a better bill. But we were... I think many of us uh, on the Labour side were shocked. Actually, quite a few on the Conservative side, if I'm fair, mm -hmm. were shocked as well that um, when it came back into the Commons after the, the committee stage, um, these were not amendments being proposed by government. I want... So, so I think it's important to mention the conservative side as mm. well, because um, obviously Barry is a very passionate campaigner on the Labour side. But I've spoken to a lot of conservative mm. activists, people that vote well, around the Conservative Party, who say this is a fundamentally unconservative setup. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they call it feudal, and the whole point of home ownership is that you you own it, and this isn't this isn't that kind of form of ownership, and. There's been a lot of, in conservative circles, a lot of first optimism with Michael Gove because Michael Gove does seem to really get it mm -hmm. uh, and he does seem to really understand the problem and really want to fix it. And then... Well, he said he'd abolish it. He said he'd abolish it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then disappointment, as, as Barry said, that that hasn't really been able to sort of play out in that way. And there are a couple of things. So one is uh, banning houses being sold under it, new houses. Obviously, flats are slightly separate, but new houses... Um, which a lot of people who I've spoken to who are in leasehold houses are really upset by because that decreases the value of their leasehold house even more if you've got the option of two houses and new build that is freehold oh, yeah. and a, con a comparative house that is leasehold and it, they think that it's helping future home buyers but not really doing anything for them and you can kind of see their point which doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it but you can see why they're upset but then there's what do you do with the existing leases and there's been a lot of resistance to that from some figures in the Conservative Party. I think Jacob Rees-Mogg has recently come out against leasehold reform on the basis that it's very difficult to historically alter change contracts that already exist and that there's something sort of unfair about retroactively going back and changing them. And I I wondered if, if Barry, someone who's worked very closely in this, what do you say to that, that it's kind of unfair to fix it in retrospect? Well, you've, you've raised a number of really interesting points, OK? The guy from Policy Exchange, yeah. um, which... James Vitale. Uh, yes, yeah. I understand is a fa fairly right-wing <laughs> think tank. Well, I, um, I, I've spoken on their panel, so I think Policy yeah, Exchange... Right, okay. you're, you're allowed to, right, okay, so I can name them. That's great. Yeah. Um, but James Vitale came and gave us evidence, and I said to him, look, you and I politically are... Not exactly fellow travellers, but would you not agree that this is profoundly uh, anti-libertarian? This is not, you know, the property-owning democracy, the, the, the freeholders that, that, that Margaret Thatcher spoke of. And he was absolutely clear this a rentier structure. Yeah. It has, you know, it has all the hallmarks of of everything that is not a free market. Um, you are a captive in this market. Um, and it, it was really interesting at, at that evidence stage of the committee to, to have us sort of joining in common yeah. cause, saying that, you know, Margaret Thatcher would really not have approved. <laughs> well, if there's common political cause that can be found, and if you've been working on this for so long, I mean, you mentioned the 2002 bill and also the conversations you were having with constituents back in 97. Um, what, what is it? What's the block on actually reforming leasehold? Well, I can tell you what it was in 2002. Yeah. Um, it was the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was so it, it was at the beginning of the the new parliament after the 2001 election. Okay. And actually, Tony and uh, and John Prescott held a sort of high stools meeting with the Parliamentary <laughs> Labour Party in Millbank. And uh, it was, you know, ask us any questions. <laughs> ties uh, off. Yeah, yeah, ties <laughs> off. You know, here, we're, we're all down <laughs> together, lads, you know, um, get the guitars out. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and... You know, all the questions were, were coming in, uh, you know, isn't it wonderful that we banned hunting? Isn't it wonderful that we, you know, all this sort of stuff. And um, I sort of timorously raised my hand and, and said, can I just point out that there are, there are I think, 
two parts of our manifesto in 1997 that we haven't delivered on. I can't remember what the other one was, actually, but but uh, there were two. And I said, and the most important of which is leasehold reform, because in 1995, Nick Rainsford and, and Frank Dobson brought out an amazingly good paper called An End to Feudalism, which set out that we would end all of the the rentier practices that that we now see right and tony sort of did a he, john was this side of him and he just he just went ah oh, john that's your department isn't it <laughs> um and of course john was then i think we still had the department of environment transport and the regions in those days so it was this huge coverall department and john looked sort of panicked and said um y- y- yes yes no no we 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 we're working on it we're working on it and from that point of course the department had to sort of kick into gear and 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 get it done but then lots of subsequent meetings with ministers and it transpired that they were really not going to tackle the the fundamentals and and make a huge change the bill that they brought forward um the lords had said if you persist with this um we will we will just delay every other aspect of your your oh, wow. agenda okay um and so it it was really a, a standoff with the lords and of course eventually we then got the the deal to get rid of most of the the, the hereditary peers because mm. in those days there was about 880 her- hereditaries and they just brought them in uh, whenever it was property, whenever right. it was land, mm-hmm. because in those days I checked the register of members' interest. Two-thirds of the peers in the House of Lords said that they derived the majority of their income from the management of land. Right. Um, <laughs> so it, that that was what blocked okay. it then. That but we sense. should have gone back to it. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. not, I don't let you know, the previous Labour government off the hook here. Mm-hmm. We should have gone back to it and we didn't. OK, yes. And you've mentioned the, the current bill, the Leasehold and Freehold Reform Bill, which had its third reading two days ago from the time of recording. Um, you've you've said, you know, forfeiture wasn't included in it and you're hoping um, that it there will be that some more meat will be put on this bill by the time it comes back to the Commons. Can you explain sort of at the moment what it encapsulates and what you would ideally like to see from the bill? I think everybody who was on the bill committee, including the minister himself, and as, as you rightly said, Rachel, M- Michael Gove understands this. He, you know, he he has spoken out against leasehold, but he hasn't managed to get it through. Um, we need to abolish leasehold. There is this bill tinkers with the whole structure of leasehold to try and make it a little bit more transparent, a little bit fairer. Um, ext- we'll extend your lease so you don't have to, you know, um, go for a lease extension that's going to cost you money. All of this is just tinkering around with a a fundamentally flawed and I would say corrupt system. Um, What we need to do is we need to move to a common hold system just like they have in every other country in the world. You know, if you go to the States, it's condominium structure. If you you go to, to Australia, it's called strata title. But everybody has some way of doing this whereby you own your property outright and you own a share and a responsibility for the common parts. And that means that you then work together. And of course, you would then appoint a managing agent, but you would be in control of the managing agent. You know, you would be telling the managing agent, yeah, we need a new roof. Yes, we need, you know, new fire doors or whatever. And, you know, initially, you talked about the the whole fallout since Grenfell. Mm. And that, of course, has turbocharged the problems for people yeah. because they found that they're in buildings which are not only unsafe, and it's not just cladding, it's fire no. stopping, it's compartmentation problems, all these fire safety issues that there are with over 11,000 blocks of flats around the UK, they reckon are, are not fire safe. Um And the leaseholders there find that they can't get the remediation work done. Um, The government thought that they were helping out with the Building Safety Act. In fact, it's made life for them worse in many respects. The whole EWS1 form, notoriously, which stands for External Wall Safety uh, Form, um, which is supposed to say, yes, your building doesn't have 
you know, inf inflammable cladding on the outside and it's OK. Um, you can't get these. People refuse to sign them off. Some conveyancing lawyers simply won't deal with properties. Um, they say, well, no, because we're not prepared to actually put our name behind this. People can't sell. They can't move on with their lives. Can I yeah, make a point about the fire yeah. safety thing? This is yeah. some friends of mine who uh, had a, a flat in a have a flat. They still have the flat, and uh, they were trying to sell. And they had a, a transaction in the works, selling the flat, moving on to a house. And this came in sort of the the, the Grenville requirements, which are really important. Like it is very very important that these buildings are fire safe and recognised as such. And their building didn't have cladding, but it did have some minor infraction that meant it was slightly complicated getting one of these certificates and the freeholder just wouldn't give it to them. And so the transaction fell through. No one will provide a mortgage. No banks right. will provide a mortgage on properties that don't have this. Uh, interestingly, you can rent them out. You, you could, you could, and that's actually what they're having to do. They're having to rent the property out. Uh, it's fine to have tenants in there, but they can't, they can't sell it. You feel conflicted because you're I've spent, renting spent, out to tenants who are living in a spent, potentially unsafe building. Well. Really conflicted. Spent yeah. two and a half years in this process and only moved on when they got pregnant and they didn't have a studio. They didn't really have any other choice. But this sort of bizarre situation where the freeholder was like, yeah, we have we have the means to do the certificate. We're just not going to. And delays and delays and delays. And that delayed their family planning by over mm -hmm. two years, which I think is a factor in how, because often it's like young couples in their first yes, home exactly, yeah. and how desperate they feel that they're unable to progress with the life that they want yeah. because of the housing situation, which is in a way more stable than renting because you can't get evicted mm -hmm. um, by, a, by a landlord who just wants to, to up the rent or, or sell off, but in a way traps you because at least if you're renting, you haven't got capital invested in the property. Mm -hmm. and it's this weird sort of feeling well, trapped and, in a property. And people who have bought their properties in shared ownership Mm. Um, are actually trapped in that way because you're not allowed to sublet them. Mm. And so I've met, I went up to Birmingham and met this um, woman, young couple who just had their first child, one bedroom flat. They couldn't move out to somewhere bigger um, to perhaps extend their family or give themselves some more space um, because or they... Or move for a job Yeah, or move for a job, move for whatever know. purpose. Yeah. Um, they couldn't and she and it, it had really affected her health and also her enjoyment of her new family life as well because they couldn't even bring renters in so that they could go and pay to live elsewhere. Um, and so it has really put people's lives on ice. And it's also affected the broader market, hasn't it? If people can't sort of shift their flats, then that has an impact. Huge. Yeah. No, it, it, look, it, it has been disastrous. I, uh, You talk about mental health issues. Um, I know of suicidal cases, um, people who've committed suicide, people who have been tempted to commit suicide, um, because they have literally been trapped in in what they thought was their dream and turned into a nightmare um and you know you probably know i produced the documentary yes. um leasehold doc dot com if anybody wants yes, and to it's watch well it, worth a watch for our um, listeners who are interested that, that in. just takes you through the lives of some people who've been living with this and and explains just how it's blighted their their lives for years um and the way in which, as, as you say, a landlord simply says, I'm not interested in doing the work. The implications of that for you and your family are enormous. We've got cases where it's not just the landlord uh, has said, we're not prepared to do the work. We can't contact the landlord. So you go through the managing agent. I've got a case like that in, in Wembley Central at the moment. And uh, we go through the managing agent. The actual landlord is registered in the Cayman Islands. And the managing agent says, yeah, yeah, we've, we've, we've notified our client of your request that they make an application to the Building Safety Fund to do this work. We're waiting to hear. Well, we're still waiting to hear and we're still waiting to hear. And they're beyond the jurisdiction of the English courts and they just don't care. So what is holding it up then? If Michael Gove understands the problem and if this has been going on for 20 years and if there is cross-party support, which I think that there is cross-party understanding of the problems. And there's no longer as many hereditary peers in the House of Lords. What, what, is, <laughs> what is holding it up? Do you have good lawyers? 
<laughs> no. No. Oh, well, I better not say it then. <laughs> <laughs> um, all, all I would suggest people do is to look in the register of interests and, and, and to see who are the big donors to the Conservative Party and look at the pressure that they have put on the government not to do this. Right. Um, because there are huge financial interests at stake and, and they really have brought muscle to bear. So uh, I, I think it, it is a case of corrupt politics. I'm not accusing any individual of corruption, but I think our politics is corrupt. It's corrupted by the, the influence that those people have, and it's corrupted by the way in which they make spurious, absolutely spurious claims about retrospectivity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you are defrauding somebody, you know, you're not telling them until they've already paid their deposit and they're signing on the dotted line that this is a leasehold property. Um, if you are defrauding somebody, if you are cheating somebody, the law should not be there to protect you. And yet they're saying, oh, well, you know, it, we have this contract and, and you can't change the law retrospectively. No, damn it. You know, you're a crook. Let's let's just call you for what you are. And it was really interesting because, you know, in 1967, I mean, you thought I was bad going back to 1997. <laughs> deep history. Deep of history. <laughs> but, but it is the deep history of leasehold. There was a rule to, to abolish what was called marriage value, okay, mm. which is, yeah. is the, the joining of the property, the lease, and, and the, 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 the freehold interest. Um, and there was a famous court case, the Custons versus Hearts of Oak. Um, and it said that marriage value. Um, should be maintained um, so that this is because the uh, leaseholder is in a unique position. It's their house and therefore they have more interest in acquiring the freehold than anybody else does. Um, everybody else wants a house or a flat. You want this one because you're already living there, right? And it's the, the it's like having one vase and wanting the the twin, or a, a saucer and wanting the cup, or you know. Um, so the courts ruled in favour of marriage value. Immediately, the Labour government came back and passed primary legislation that absolutely reversed that. And, and that's what we've got to do. We've got to say public policy demands. This is, you know, this is about what is right in society and, and the health of our, our, our housing system, the health of our financial system depends on having a fair market here. And it's not fair at the moment. So, you know, legislators do just need to bite the bullet. And, you know, that's why I'm delighted that, that you know, Matthew Pennycook, who's the Labour spokesperson, yeah. uh, has been very clear that this is a manifesto commitment, that we are committed to wholesale reform here and to bringing in common hold tenure. And it's not just bringing it in for all future flats that are built, because, of course, you've got to address this for all the the leasehold properties that exist at the moment. Uh, and it's transfer transferring those to a common hold structure that's really important. And it will liberate people. It will absolutely liberate people. So that's Labour's pledge then. And yeah. None of the five missions are sort of housing specific. Um, are you apprehensive that it might not appear in Labour's manifesto, this, this pledge? I'm apprehensive about everything. <laughs> I, I'm so, look, come on. I've been waiting 14 years for another Labour government. I want the lot and I want it all in the manifesto on day one. And I want every bit of it done within 100 days. You know, <laughs> I couldn't be more keen to actually get on with the job of governing this country properly. So, yeah, of course, I want it in the manifesto. But, I, you know, that's what I think will happen. I think okay. there will be that commitment there. And and, and Matthew and others have been very clear about it. Brilliant. I think we have to let you go. So thank oh. you so much, Barry. That was really great. It was a great conversation. We're really glad that you came on to talk about it. Thanks so much for watching. We'd love to know what you think. Please make sure you leave your comments below. And if you enjoyed watching this podcast, you can watch more of our videos on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to like and subscribe.